let me invite us to open our Bibles to Galatians, Galatians, the third chapter, Galatians chapter three. How many of you have been here for all of the messages in Galatians? Let's see your hand. How many of you have enjoyed that? It's been a blessing. Let's see your hand. How many have taken notes? Let's see your hand. I'm thankful that we have this privilege and wonderful opportunity to preach the gospel and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me remind you, the Apostle Paul writing to the churches at Galatia, there are multiple churches, we call it the letter to the Galatians, and the Apostle Paul was dealing with the gospel of Jesus Christ versus another, a different kind of gospel. And I believe we have a message in that for today. Because what we're finding so often is a different gospel. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ so often that we hear today that is called the gospel. The apostle Paul has already confronted Peter because of his, how would you call it in the modern term, the two-facedness. <laughs> Peter would sit and fellowship with the Gentile Christians until a Jewish Christian walked in the door and he'd get up and make himself not available because he did not want to be seen with the Gentile Christians. And as a result of that, the apostle Paul, the scripture says, confronted him privately and then he confronted him to his face for his two-facedness, for his compromising of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. We're in Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians 3, we'll look at the first nine verses in this chapter as we look at the study today. The apostle Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now uh, made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doth he... It by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith. Verse 6 and following. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing the, that God could just, would justify the heathen through, the faith, through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Thank you and we may be seated. By the way, just a little uh, footnote to that. This text in Galatians 3 and other verses and then in uh, Galatians the 6th chapter and we'll get to it to by and by are some of the most controversial texts in relationship to Calvinism. Calvinist says that uh, the church is spiritual Israel and some use this text that is before us today linked with some verses out of Galatians 6 to validate that point. It talks about spiritual Abraham. And we're the children of Abraham, the scripture says. Does that mean that we are uh, the Christians or the church today? Simply a spiritual uh, Judaism? That is not what the scripture is saying at all. Let me say also, by the way, thank you for those that are joining us by TEC on television. We pray that this will be a time of worship for us all as we serve the Lord through studying his word. Thank you so much. We're in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 9. As a result of what they were seeing in the Galatian churches, some were being led away to believe that uh, it takes works along with grace for salvation. Now, perhaps you have believed that. Perhaps you've believed that if you are saved, you really prove that you're saved by doing good things. Perhaps if you are saved, you think that I'm saved, but I've got to add these works to it to make me truly be saved. Never will forget a number of years ago, visiting one of our sons, and he had a guest, a friend of his over, and uh, not uh, our son's problem or fault, but I was on his back porch uh, sitting as they were sitting around the pool, and we were talking, and uh, the young man talking about his relationship to the Lord, he said, well, I was saved by grace, but I live uh, by the Torah. <laughs> Anything wrong with that? <laughs> 
There are a lot of people today that think that you can be saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then add to that the celebration of the Jewish holidays and holidays and follow every letter of the Old Testament law, forgetting that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, think not that I've come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The word destroy means to abrogate, to abridge, to change, to nullify, to modify in some fashion. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament law. In me, if you say yes to Jesus Christ, in me, you do not need to follow the letter of the Old Testament law is literally translated what would be said. As a result of their these false teachers, the Judaizers coming into the churches at Galatia, they were convincing the Galatian believers that there was something more to it than just faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, rites, rules, regulations, and rituals of the era. There are a lot of people today that feel more spiritual if you can follow some rites, R-I-T-E-S, rituals, rules, and regulations, and the Old Testament law. There are multitudes of Christian churches today that follow much of the Jewish Old Testament laws and rituals to make themselves look more spiritual. Now listen, I understand most of the holy days and holidays and the rituals in the Old, in the Old Testament under Judaism pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand that. But if you're in a Christian church and you've already received that which the Old Testament law pointed to, and that's receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, what's the point in going back and putting yourself under the law of the rites, rituals, rules, and regulations. That's what Paul is dealing with in the churches at Galatia. He was challenging them as believers not to compromise the gospel. They were being deceived and deluded by these Judaizers, the false teachers, some teaching that work salvation is needed. The apostle Paul confronts them with a series of what I call very serious theological doctrinal questions that we find in this text before us. The major thing the, the Apostle Paul is asking him, who hath bewitched you? It's a fascinating word study, by the way. Who hath bewitched you? There are three things that I want us to notice in our time together. Notice, first of all, the searing confrontation recorded in verse 1. Notice, secondly, the searching challenge reveals, reviewed in verses 2 through 5. And then notice, thirdly, the supporting confirmation revealed in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. First of all, in that first verse, the searing confrontation recorded. Now listen, before I read and exegete that first verse, in modern Christianity, there's a timidity that says, you know, if they're preaching and teaching something that's wrong, if they're saying something that is out of context with the Word of God, I just need to be silent. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I might run somebody away. I might lose some numbers, nickels, and noses in the congregation. So I'm just simply going to teach easy believism and not going to touch on the real elements of the faith that's taught in the Word of God. That's the modern cultural woke society today and the belief system that we have pervading our churches Notice the irate charge, and I say irate. Paul is ticked off. <laughs> He's been out of shape at this point. He is simply uh, very pointed and poignant in what he is saying to them. Paul is incensed, as one writer put it, as he speaks to them in very sharp tone and very pointed uh, conversation with the believers at Galatia. Oh, foolish Galatians. What does the word foolish mean? Let me just give you a little word study. It means without thinking. It means senseless. It is a lack of wisdom from God. And the key understanding of that word is stupid. Stupid. So let's translate it. Oh, stupid Galatians. <laughs> he gets right to the point very quickly. He points out their stupidity in what they're doing and believing the loose likes lost liberals that's coming into the churches and saying, it's okay to get saved by faith. It's all right to believe in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, but add these layers and layers and layers and layers of rites, rituals, rules, and regulations to what you believe makes you saved as a saved person. He's simply saying, you foolish, stupid thinking, senseless lack of wisdom from God, Galatians. Paul charges them with being senseless. He charges them for being absolutely stupid in their falling away and following false teachers. Now, let me just bring it down to where, as the old cliche, the water hits the wheel. How many times have you listened to a preacher or preaching or a teaching and you think, well, there's something that just doesn't sound right, but he must be right because he's reading from the scripture. It must be correct, and I need to change my theology and my position. 
I'm a little bit weary, and I can say this because of where I stand. I'm a little bit weary with Christians that have been saved 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years and still do not have an iota of understanding of the Word of God and be swayed with every wind of doctrine that comes down the path. There are multitudes today that will believe anything that they hear or say, see or say. One not too long ago said that the one that was teaching that she was following was a Christian scholar, a Bible scholar. What makes one a scholar? Uh, sometimes a scholarship can be way, way, way off when it comes to the rudimentary, fundamental, elemental things that's taught in the Word of God. You might be a scholar in what you're saying and doing, but that does not mean you are theologically sound in what you're preaching and teaching if it does not follow the written, revealed, inspired, infallible Word of God. To the believer, we need to understand that false doctrine and false teachers will tell you that you can be saved by works rather than by faith in the finished work of Calvary on Calvary's cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sheer stupidity, the Apostle Paul says. Why would they turn from justification by faith to following works and the letter of the law? What causes Christians today to believe the false teachers and the false preaching and the false theology that permeates society? I can critique preachers, as the little boy says, because I are one. <laughs> I've watched too many of them that will take a little word here, a verse here, and a verse here, and make the juxtaposition and make it jump off the page and sound relevant and real and theologically sound. Slick as glass. Robert Morris, that's in trouble now for some moral failures, as it's called, taught from his pulpit that Jesus Christ was not divine until he ascended back in heaven. They might have a little different opinion today. I don't know. But there are a lot of folks today that are teaching false doctrine and false theology that we need to understand does not comply with what the Word of God teaches and says. The Apostle Paul in his irate charge, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, notice secondly the irrational condition. Who hath bewitched you? Who hath bewitched you? Paul's referring to. Notice he says who. He didn't say what. He didn't say what has bewitched you. He says who has done it. Who has bewitched you? It's the, he's referring here to the Judaizers, the false teachers, the Jewish uh, false teachers. They literally followed the Apostle Paul every foot of the way, every place that he would go as he was starting new churches in the then known world. They would follow him and try to tear down his apostleship and to challenge what he's preaching and teaching and would try to undermine the theological soundness of what he had, was teaching. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? These uh, teachers... False teachers teaching that you need to go back and add the Mosaic law. You need to go back and add circumcision for salvation. Bewitch simply means, let me give you the understanding, to cast an evil spell. It's demonic influence. It means to mislead by evil influence, to charm, to hypnotize, to fascinate, to lead into evil, to seduce to evil. Does that give you a pretty good understanding of the word bewitched? Who has bewitched you? Who's cast an evil spell over you? What are the demonic influences that's leading you? What's causing you to be led by this evil spirit? What's causing you to be hypnotized and fascinated and led astray and being seduced to do something that's theologically unsound and doctrinally false? That's what Paul is asking them. It's a pretty pointed question. We could ask that question today to multitudes of Christians and multitudes of them could not tell you how many books in the Bible. In fact, you've heard me say before, it's a little point of pun, some Christians might think that the epistles are the apostles' wives. <laughs> You'll get that tomorrow maybe. But uh, there's a, there are a lot of folks today that do not follow and fathom the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Usually can be done, this phony teaching can be done by phony praise. It is the sounding godly, the spiritual biblical scholarship as some call themselves. The Galatian believers had been seduced, hypnotized, charmed by the clever sounding arguments of the out of context scriptural teaching where they're bending scripture to make it fit their need and what they desire. They're those today, you've heard me say before, 
there are those today that out of the LGBTQIP plus uh, agenda that's saying that in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19, that it was not the act of sodomy that God condemned and burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground. It was because of a lack of hospitality, because they were not hospitable, did not invite those to come in that were visiting. That's what the sodomites will tell you today. And they say it with a straight face. And multitudes in the Christian churches today are believing it and embracing it because they do not know what the Word of God says. I think it's time as Christians we get back to the foundation of study the Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman, not being ashamed, but rightly dividing the Word of truth. We need to rightly divide it. That means cut it straight, if you will. If you get a good uh, farmer's background picture of that, there's the plowman with the plow and the mule, and he puts the plow point in the ground, and he aims at a pine tree about 100 yards away, and he just follows that tree. That's cutting it straight, and that's what we need to do with the Word of God is cutting it straight, interpreting it based on the authority of the Scripture, not based on some uh, de denominational dogma that we want to add on top of what the Scripture says and make it stand up and bark and call it a dog. <laughs> We need to recognize what Paul is saying. He's saying your condition is simply uh, ir irrational. It is irresponsible. It's not uh, uh, thorough understanding. You're under a spell that's been placed upon you. Under a spell. These false teachers had turned their eyes from Jesus Christ to false teaching charm to charm someone into believing it. They were acting as under a magical spell being charmed. Someone said, and may I quote this, I find it fascinating. This person wrote this, said, Have you ever seen a snake slip up on its prey? A mouse or a small bird? I'm told the snake will lock eyes and stare gazing into the eyes as he slowly is seductively approaching until he strikes his prey. That gives a pretty good picture of what happens with false teaching today. False teaching will not tell you I'm going to tell you a lie. They will not preach and teach and say that what I'm saying is not true. There's a lot of printing material out there today. There's, there are tons of things on the Internet today that sound slick and it's well-produced Madison Avenue production, but it is not the Word of God. We need to be very, very careful as Christians what we believe and what uh, has a connotation in our hearts and minds of theological soundness. The Galatians had been charmed. You have those... Uh, Jesse DePlantis can charm the shoes off a person. <laughs> uh, Robert Tilton, you don't see him very much anymore. Joseph Prince, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, Cleefro Dollar, Kenneth Copeland. I could go on and on and on with the list of those that will charm you into believing that what they're saying is theologically sound. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and following tells you why they say that. To make merchandise of you to make merchandise of the Christians today. Perhaps that charm and that deceit will buy another jet airplane. I don't know. Paul realizes that behind the words and the works of these false teachers is the deceiving, deluding, dooming, hypnotic work of Satan that's working in their lives. Most do not realize Satan's come to tear down and destroy, to break through and steal, the Scripture says. Many do not realize that Satan will delude and deceive one into believing a lie is the truth. If you don't believe that, the next time you have an evil thought, the next time you have uh, uh, a propensity to do or say something, uh, wonder where that propensity is coming from. What is the motivation? What comes across? Someone has said, well, you know, I don't know what, uh, uh, what in the world controlled them. Why did they do that? It's because many times it is a demonic spirit. It is that demon spirit that's working, and he's working today in society and in churches as never before in the tearing down and destroying of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's smooth talk. The same is true today. Some will listen to the smooth charm of the seducing words of the false teachers from false teaching and what they're saying and will turn from the sound doctrine and theological truth. I'm convinced that the blindness and senseless teaching of some of the preaching today is the cause of what we see taking place in our nation. Listen very carefully. You can disagree if you like. Tell God, don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but I believe the condition of the church 
promulgates and brings about the condition in our nation straight from the Oval Office and across the nation today, politically speaking. Had the church remained the salt and light that God says that we're to be, we, I believe, would not be seeing the deterioration and the immoral uh, quagmire that we're in as a nation. Churches are silent. Preachers are silent. They're afraid that somehow, some way, they might lose some numbers, nickels, and noses. Therefore, they won't stand for truth, will not stand with a spiritual spine that says this is a lie, this ought not to be, and we need to challenge it. There's some that believe, well, preacher, don't you realize that every law in the land, Christians ought to bend, bow, and obey it? Not so at all. If any law, any rule, any regulation counters the rules, the regulation, and the laws of God, we need to say, no, 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 will not bow, will not bend. And as a result of what we seeing, or we're seeing today, we're witnessing and watching the lawlessness. We're watching the moral quagmire take place in our nation. And much of it comes as a result of Christians so-called believing and bending for false theology and false doctrine and not taking a stand for truth, the truth of the word of God. Thus saith the word is the position that we ought to take today. We see the irate charge the irrational condition. But notice the inconceivable conduct. Verse 1, that you should not only follow the truth, that is the gospel, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently, that's clearly, openly, publicly set forth, proclaimed, preached, portrayed, crucified among you. Listen, Paul says, your conduct is inconceivable unbelievable, unrealistic, and unbiblical, if you please. He says, you know the truth. You know the truth of what the doctrine of salvation is about. You know what justification by faith without works of the law is about. You know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation by faith through uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has pre been preached, he said, May I say, they've been bewitched, seduced, influenced by the subtle charm of demonic spirits. Let me give you an elongated quote from Dr. John Phillips. Dr. Phillips said this, and you've heard me harp on something similar to this for less than 100 years. It is the old trick of interpretation, uh, interpreting a scripture without regard to the context, without regard to the scope and the purpose of the book in which it is found, and without regard to the people to whom the particular pay, uh, passage was addressed. We must find out under what circumstances and by whom a passage was written. We must regard the culture, the history, and the geography that form the background of the passage. We must consider the usual rules of of grammar that apply and consider the dispensation to which the passage belongs, Amen. end quote. It's a pretty long statement. You want me to summarize that for us? Context, 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 context. If it's a text out of context, it's a pretext. It should never be used for a text. You understand that, don't you? <laughs> There are a lot of folks that will look at John 3, 16 and say how wonderful it is. But before John 3, 16, there was John 3, 1 through 15 that brings about. John 3, 16 starts with for. That's the little word gar, because. It's giving the cause of what's been said in verses 1 through 15. And most of the time we'll take verses out of context and never have any understanding. And then there'll be those that will take a verse out of the Old Testament. Uh, a lot of folks like to take Deuteronomy 28 and 29, the cursing and blessing text. That's wonderful. We can apply it uh, theologically, doctrinally from the standpoint, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that's what he said to Israel, he'll do that for us. But that in context is spoken to Israel, the Jewish people. We need to recognize context. We need to recognize and understand dispensation. Is it the Old Testament or the New Testament? Is it to the Jewish people or is it to the Christian, to the church today? And there's a lot of misunderstanding in that. The church age, by the way, is a different dispensation. Any proper exegesis of the Old Testament must consider the dispensational differences. Grace is not law. Calvary changed the basics of God's dealing with man. The church is not Israel. Although the believing Jews in the churches said uh, Galatia were gathered together and they were called the Israel of God. Dr. Phillips said this, Mount Sinai imposes a different set of principles than does Mount Calvary, end quote. 
Many today will be hypnotized by false teachers and false teaching. Let me read you two or three illustrations that I think are pertinent. If I can get my glasses focused, there's pretty small print on this. <laughs> this man, his name is Jack Hurst, a 40-year-old sales executive who lives in Newmarket, Ontario, says for almost of about 18 years he attended the United Church, Serv United Church Services and had one of his children baptized in the church even though he found the services were boring and to him irrelevant. Further, it says... He says, last October, he discovered a, uh, the New Market Church, a six-year-old evangelical church with about 50 miles from where he lived. It featured special lighting effects, rock music during the Sunday service. Since then, Hurst and his family have regularly attended the church services, and his, he and his wife joined a group of mothers who go to the church for sessions that combine Bible-based discussions of women's issues with aerobics classes and craft demonstrations. He said, this is entertaining and relevant day by day. It's good stuff. Indeed, across North America, thousands of young adults are making similar discoveries as churches offer a wide range of services in order to uh, get in lure and to entice members of the baby boomers generation back into their pews. Now listen to this. Leaders of the New Style churches say they are increasingly adopting a marketing approach to religion because traditional practices have discovered with no potentiality of getting parishioners into the churches. Churches to get into their entertainment need to get into the entertainment business, said Reverend David Brandon, the 41-year-old senior pastor of a church. Brandon says that his church gives members a signed guarantee, listen, that promises we won't bore you, we will always be relevant, we won't pressure you. We won't ask you for any money. Among the most successful of these new mega churches is the sprawling 64-year-old Second Baptist Church in Houston, which advertises itself as providing a fellowship of excitement. It's at Second Baptist Church, you can join one of the 36 different base, uh, basketball teams run by the church, take part in a so-called Master's Blast workout in the church's glass wall fitness center, and then afterwards soak into any of the two different jacuzzis. A well, as well, members can be can, uh, members can see broadband-style musical shows performed uh, by various uh, church choirs, including Hooray for Hollywood, a salute to movie industry combined with the, uh, a religious service. Said uh, one of the members, a 29-year-old Houston systems analyst and a member of the church, aerobics or ball games are f uh, f followed by prayer. This makes everything relevant and spiritual. <laughs> The new approach, said uh, Reverend Glenn Teal, senior pastor at another church, uh, uh, said, shows young uh, professionals that we're not ivory towered Christians. He said that their church begins uh, ramping up its services about three years, ramping up their service about three years ago by installing color, colored lights near the church's altar, encouraging members to, uh, to act out funny portions with little vignettes during worship and introducing a middle-of-the-road pop music program. To keep abreast with the changing religious uh, taste, some members of the clergy say that they are alternating the tone of their sermons by removing any archaic language, introducing modern themes, making the image of God less judgmental, and the old tire and fire and brimstone sermons are out because it's for the past and not for the present. Is that what we see happening in today's Christian society? Absolutely. And I think this is putting it pretty mildly. When you look at the totality of it, investigate the bottom line, we have destroyed, abrogated, and abridged anything that's called true biblical Christianity in the local New Testament church so that we're relevant and will fill the pews. Therein lies the problem. Dr. Vance Havener said this, 
the majority of church members show very little, if any, evidence of having been born again. Worldliness is rampant in the church. The devil is not fighting churches. He is joining them. He is not persecuting Christians. He is professing it. What many think is the world becoming more Christian is Christians becoming more worldly. Makes a lot of sense. If you want to build big churches based on a promotional program rather than based on allowing the Holy Spirit of God to do the building. Now here's a third illustration of what we see is in the same vein of destroying true biblical Christianity. I was listening to a radio broadcast a few years back on 88.1. This particular person was talking. He was out of Brunswick, Georgia. His name was Sid Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, promoting a set of tapes on healing. He said, you can be healed and learn how to heal others. Listen to this carefully. His illustration was this. His illustration was healing a man in Chicago. One leg was three inches shorter than the other. The hip joint rotated, ankle turned, and he healed him. It reversed. He healed him again. It reversed again. He prayed, Lord, why is this healing not taking hold? He healed him again. Uh, the same thing then. He looked at the man's knee in the spirit, and in the spirit he saw a two-foot-long snake coiled around his knee. He said, I knew then it was a generational curse. He said, when I broke the curse, his leg was healed. Where is this found in the scripture? It's called voodoo theology. And yet together that's what we find that's building churches today and people following false doctrine and false theology. Who hath bewitched you? The apostle Paul asked the believers, the churches in Galatia. Notice not only we see the Syrian confrontation recorded. You, I, you probably figured we'd eventually get out of verse 1. Verses two, verses 2 through 5, we see the searching challenge reviewed. The searching challenge reviewed in order to point out clearly and convincingly that these false teachers, these Judaizers were teaching error and not biblical teaching, the apostle Paul challenged these Galatian believers with four very, very, very pertinent questions, searching questions, theological questions. First of all, the inquiry of conversion, the inquiry of conversion. Verse 2, this only, Paul says, one thing I want to ask you dudes, one, one question I want to get answered from you. This one thing would I learn of you, that is, I'm going to ask you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He said, how did you get saved? How did you get saved? That's a question that I believe needs to be asked to every Christian. How did you get saved? I was listening to some uh, jabber jaw uh, on the radio broadcast the other day after our program was off and uh, I was in the vehicle and uh, there was two people talking and they were talking about how a person knows that he's saved and doesn't know that he's saved. And said, so, well, you know, when uh, Elizabeth and Mary talked, uh, uh, the baby leapt in the womb of Elizabeth. That was uh, uh, John the Baptist. And uh, that was indication, this, right, this uh, speaker said, that John the Baptist was baptized with the Holy Spirit and got saved while in the mother's womb. He said, the other said, well, how do we apply that today? He said, well, it's a good application. He said, a lot of people are concerned and confused. They don't know if they're saved or when they got saved or the date they got saved or the time they got saved or how they got saved. He said, listen, it could have been that even in your mother's womb, the Holy Spirit came upon you and you were saved in the mother's womb. So don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about a date, time, and a place that you said yes to Jesus. I almost wrecked my car. <laughs> If you can be saved and not know when and how and where, you can be lost and never miss it. It's a danger today with Christians that say I'm saved and can't identify when they got saved, how you know you're saved. Back and back and back and back, less than 100 years ago, the Sunday school teacher, 12-year-old boys and girls, boys and girls, you're 12 years old. It's time that we all walk down front and that we uh, join the church today. So, boys and girls, when the invitation is given, I'm going to stand up walking down. I want all of you to follow me and we'll join the church today. A lot of folks have joined the church and not joined Jesus. A lot of folks today are church members, but they're lost as a green ball in high weeds. Picture that on a golf course. <laughs> May I remind you some teachers are ignorant of the truth, uh, choose uh, to be ignorant of the text one or the other. 
Uh, remember, error is still error regardless of who may have taught it or preached it or said it. It makes no difference how much Bible is quoted. If it is in error, if it is false teaching, it is still false teaching. He says, how do you get saved? How did you get saved? If you're saved, how did you do so? Let me just pause for a moment. You don't have to say amen or oh me. You don't have to put your hands down or get up and walk out. But how many of you today can say, preacher, I know I'm saved. I remember when I invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I remember that day and time and place when I knew that I was lost and on my way to a devil's hell and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Save me. Help me to live for you because you died for me. Listen, I'm here to tell you if that's never happened to you, you need to get saved today. If you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart and save me, you're not saved by osmosis. You're not saved by being a good person. You're not saved by being a Baptist. You're not saved by being a Methodist, a Presbyterian, or any other ism or schism. You're saved by faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. With the heart we believe, and with the mouth we confess unto salvation, the Scripture tells us. May I say to you, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the Galatians that have chosen to follow a demonic spirit. The Galatian believers were saved on Paul's first missionary journey. He's saying, how did you get saved? Do you remember when you got saved? Someone said, and may I quote, the law says do. Grace says done. The law said try. Grace says trust. The law says behave. Grace says believe. The law points to the commandments. Grace points to Christ. The weakness of the law is the flesh. The wonder of grace is the Holy Spirit of God working in and through our hearts and lives to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. The inquiry of conversion. The second question is the inquiry of consecration. He says, are you so foolish? Are you so senseless? Are you so stupid? <laughs> are you so stupid? Having begun in the spirit that is by faith, are you now made perfect that is mature, teleos, complete, consecrated by the flesh? Paul is asking a question about their consecration to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He said, are you so foolish that you started out with the spirit that is by faith, and now you're made mature uh, and you're consecrated by the flesh? He's asking a pretty redundant question. This is the reason he's called them stupid. <laughs> he said, are you dumb enough to believe that you can get saved by faith and that you can be consecrated to God, that you can be uh, growing in justification without the Holy Spirit of God, that it's all done in the flesh? That's what Paul is asking. He's asking a very pertinent question. Paul says, are you so senseless that you believe that somehow you could get saved by faith and mature and grow in sanctification by the works that you're doing? Galatians 4, 8 through 10. Let me just read quickly some of these verses. Galatians 4, 8, 9, and 10. Howbeit then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are not God, no gods. But now after you have known God, or rather that you are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you your labor in vain." Paul is still saying throughout the book of Galatians, how is it that you've gotten saved by faith and you're wanting to follow false teaching that says you've got to stay saved by the works that you do? It's the works of the flesh. He's basically saying it's an impossibility. He's basically reminding them again, you're turning from the real gospel to another gospel. You're turning to a false gospel. You're being seduced and hypnotized and enticed by these false teachers that tell you you've got to do some kind of works. They're diluting and destroying, Scripture twisting even then. And we find the dilution and the Scripture twisting today more than in my lifetime. Not only we see the inquiry of conversion, the inquiry of consecration, but notice the inquiry of commitment in verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain? That is, have you suffered so many things? Listen, in that era, if you said, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, you could lose your job, you could lose your home, you could lose everything that you've got. There would be the persecution and the prosecution because of being saved. The Apostle Paul says, have you suffered so many things in vain? That is, for nothing, if be yet in vain. Paul said, when you got saved, 
your convictional commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ brought about persecution and suffering and pain and peril. And now have you gone, done that for nothing? Have you gone through that uh, claim of salvation for nothing? Have you said, I'm saved and it's not real? Is it in vain? Paul asked them of their suffering for Jesus. He said, was the gospel wrong? Did you make a wrong decision? Did you trust, put your faith in Jesus for nothing? And Paul continues, if it be yet in vain. Paul says, I sure hope it's not in vain what you've done in claiming to be saved. I hope it's not vacuous and void with no value and with no impartation of strength and power in your life. Paul hopes that they will cling to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, cling to the old rugged cross, as this old song says, and reject the works. I'm going to pause for a moment again. Can you recall when you first got saved? Can you recall the zeal and the conviction and the commitment and the desire to serve the Lord? If you don't have that same conviction and that same zeal and that same joy today, you need to check up, see if you're saved. There's a problem, I believe, in our churches today across America. And the problem is, I, in my most humble opinion, that we have so many folks that are good church members but are going to die and go to devil's hell. In 1975, I listened to a radio broadcast of Dr. Billy Graham. And in that message, he had a little footnote. And he said, uh, it is highly probable that 25% of church members are lost. And I've said since then, I believe about 90%. I believe in all of our churches across denominational lines, we might have 10% that are truly blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again. Why do I say that? Because when you study the Scripture, the Scripture, the tithe this mind saith the Lord, he's not talking about dollars and cents. Every human being, my most humble opinion, based on a cursory study across the Scriptures, when we get to heaven, about 10% of all of those on the face of God's earth called human beings will be in that place called heaven, about 10%. Heaven today is too small to contain, to house those in the world that say that they're saved. And God's not going to have to send a building and wrecking crew to enlarge heaven. won't happen. So the question is, have you been deceived into believing that you're saved? That's what Paul is saying to the church, to the believers in, at Galatia. Are you sure that you're saved? And the fourth question, inquiry of channel, that is in verse 5. He, that is speaking of God, therefore, that ministereth, that is literally supplies you the spirit, that is supply, that is the channel, that is the method, that is the way, uh, God's firsthand bountiful supplies, what he's talking about, present continuous tense in the Greek text. God keeps on supplying the Holy Spirit to us so that we can live for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something that happened then and quits. It is the continuation of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the channel. That's the mechanism. That's the avenue. That's the doorway by which we serve the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation and after salvation. We're saved by the Holy Spirit. We're kept saved by the Holy Spirit via the Word of God. I quoted this partially to you a moment ago. Let me uh, read it to us from the Scripture in Romans 10. Verse 14 and following, How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of grace and, being, and uh, bring in glad tidings of good things. Uh, verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who had believed our report? Going back to uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by dear through the word of God. We say yes to Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, through the preached word of God. And we're saved by the word, and we're saved and sealed and kept uh, uh, in the hand of God until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30 tells us. And it's all by the Holy Spirit of God. Notice, notice he says, and worketh miracles among you, 
Does he, that's God, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The signs and the miracles and the wonders that were used in that era was to point out the validity of the truth of the word of God. We have those that are talking about signs, miracles, and wonders today. Listen, signs, miracles, and wonders were used in the New Testament and the Old Testament, the New Testament, to validate the message and the messenger. If you're going to wait until some sign, miracle, or wonder takes place for you to make a determination on what job to get or what uh, clothes to wear, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then you're in deep, deep, deep trouble. We need to understand and recognize what Paul is saying. The signs, miracles, and wonders were used for a person to see and believe the word of God as preached and proclaimed by the preacher, apostle, teacher of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we see the uh, searing confrontation recorded and the searching challenge reviewed, but notice the supporting confirmation in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. Notice, first of all, the illustration case. Paul sets forth uh, his uh, uh, confirmation of justification by faith in going back to Abraham uh, and his faith. Notice what the scripture says in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You can go back to Genesis 15, 6 and see Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him, accounted, counted to his, put to his credit for righteousness, for goodness, if you please, uh, please before God. Faith or works is what people talk about today. The Judaizers were pointing to Moses and the law, and Paul transcends the law and goes back to Abraham. How was Abraham justified? By faith, by faith, not in works. Abraham was saved simply by grace, which was made effective when he believed God. Go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and following. God told Abraham to leave her and go to another city. Hebrews 11, 9, and 10 tells us that he did by faith. You can go to Genesis 15, 1 through 6, when Abraham was uh, uh, put to his faith and trust in God when he said that he believed God. What God said about uh, the coming seed, notice Abraham was made the righteousness, the scripture says. We see God's unconditional covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 and uh, verse 8 and following. The Judaizers were proud to claim to be Abraham's seed. Go in your leisure and read. And let's see if I can find it quickly. I'll read it for us. John 8, 33. In John 8, 33, this is what was said. Then answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Let's drop down to about 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Notice what he said then in verse 39. And answered and said unto Abraham, Our father, Jesus, saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Verse 41. Do ye do the deeds of your father? Then said they, to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They were claiming to have a relationship with Abraham and claiming that they're okay because they're the seed of Abraham. And here we find the apostle Paul using part of that in part to make his point of saying, he's saying, learn from this evidence. Therefore, know ye that is knowing to learn. Therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Verse 7 and 8 is the refute Refutable confirmation that Paul is giving them. Paul reminds them that the false teachers were irrefutable confirmation of salvation and justification by faith, and they were saying, now you add to that some works. Paul points back to Abraham as the evidence of faith and not works that's accounted for righteousness. Irrefutable confirmation. He says, learn, basically, what is the evidence, therefore, that they which are faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Let me pause for a moment. What does it mean to be the children, the huios, the child of Abraham? And it's speaking of faith, not the seeds of his progeny. progeny. He's talking about that faith factor that Abraham had. If we as believers, Gentile believers today, have the same faith as Abraham said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's simply pointing out that it is faith, it is the faith factor. 
The same are the children that is born of the same faith, he's saying. So these false teachers priding themselves of being Jewish. See, he says, so you're claiming some special status with God because of your heritage and your lineage? Abraham is the father of the faithful, we find. The Judaizers taught that, Judaizers taught that through works of circumcision, one becomes genuine sons of Abraham. But it's faith, not works, that makes one true as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Physical birth did not make one the children of Abraham, a text that I've enjoyed for less than 100 years. The, the latter portion of the text points that out. You need not turn to it, but it's in Luke, the 19th chapter. Most of us know that because it's talking about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, came down so fast it left that sycamore tree slick, and it's been slick ever since. <laughs> Let me quickly read you, if I can pick a spot, there's 10 verses that are pertinent, but I'm going to try to cut through the chase. Verse 6, and he made haste and came down and received him, that's Jesus, receiving Jesus joyfully. It's obedience to the call here. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, look intently and see, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if, first class conditional clause, since, since I have taken things away from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. Required by law that it be one, uh, just simply twofold. He's doing fourfold, double what the law says. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Listen, because he said yes to Jesus Christ, he's a son by descendant of Abraham, but he's a son here by decision, placing his faith and trust in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't make any difference. You might be the son, brother, daughter, or aunt, uncle, cousin of a saved person. You might say, well, my daddy was a preacher. My brother was a preacher, et cetera, et cetera. Makes no difference. Salvation is an individual volitional choice to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It's not brought to us by heritage. It's not brought to us by cause of the bloodstream in our veins. It's based on our volitional decision to say yes to Jesus Christ or to reject him as Savior and as Lord. Physical birth did not to make one the child of Abraham. The Judaizers were not true children of Abraham anyway. It's alone, no more, no less. It is a decision by faith. Verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify just as if I had never sinned, it's justification. And the, verse 8 now, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's talking about the Gentiles, through faith preached before, pros in front of the gospel unto Abraham, saying in thee, pointing to Jesus, uh, the seed shall all nations be blessed. Listen, we see first of all the inspiration of scripture. Inspiration of scripture. The scriptures foreseeing, that is the inspiration of the scripture, the gospel, the good news, that all nations would be brought into spiritual blessing through the seed that is Jesus. And that's clearly pointed out, by the way, in the sixth chapter of Galatians. It's not talking about seeds plural, but the seed singular. And that is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as the inspiration of scripture foreseeing the future tense of what would take place. Jesus' birth, life, and death is the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's not the gospel that was preached to Abraham as talking about here. The good news preached to Abraham was, in thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the evangelion, the good news that was preached to Abraham, that through him would come a Savior, the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the good news of the gospel today for the child of God. It's his death, burial, and resurrection, and soon coming again. That is the totality of the gospel. Nothing more and nothing less. No work shall be added. Not only we see the inspiration of Scripture, but the individuals of salvation in that eighth verse. God would justify the heathen, that's the Gentile, through faith, not works, preached the gospel, that's the good news, unto Abraham. Paul 
keeps on reminding the Galatians that salvation is by faith. Throughout all of the book of Galatians, he's trying to dissuade them in their pathway of following false teaching and additions to the gospel by rites, rituals, rules, and regulations, bringing them back to the fact that salvation is faith and faith alone in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. May I say... God's full intention that the Galatian Gentile believers should be justified by faith. God's plan has always been justification by faith in the finished work of the cross for the Jews and for the Gentiles. The doctrine of justification by faith is both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The good news as preached to Abraham is that anyone who believes, trusts, faiths the Lord Jesus Christ shall be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Finally, I want us to notice the inevitable conclusion in verse 9. The inevitable conclusion. Notice, so then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Notice what the scripture says. Paul concludes with the simplistics and the fact the conclusion of the inevitable presenting here is the provision of salvation is made for all people that will say yes to Christ. Whosoever will may come, the scripture tells us. God is not slack concerning his promise, uh, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's God's plan. That's God's plan of salvation, that all would come to repentance but all thus far have not. All will not. You can preach and teach the gospel. You can give the plan of salvation to 100 people. Some will say yes to Jesus Christ and some will reject it. Our responsibility is not saving anybody. Our responsibility is sowing the seed. Let the Holy Spirit do the watering. The Holy Spirit of God doing the harvesting. And you're sitting here today. Some are tuned in by way of television. Holy Spirit of God is saying you need to get saved. You need to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. You need to believe in the finished work on Calvary's cross as Savior. The scripture here says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You see the distinction between God's provision of salvation, whosoever will, and those that will be saved by faith. It takes an act of faith, man's appropriation of the blessings of salvation. God has never saved anyone based on the law. Who hath bewitched you? Paul says. So my question in closing, have you been bewitched? <laughs> have you believed a demonic lie and somehow somewhat thinking that good works and good deeds will make me all right. Perhaps you heard the story. It was back in our ear that there was a famous evangelist that preaching all over the nation. And he told the story, he told the story about one man and he said, are you saved? He showed him his ring. It was a Masonic Lodge ring. He said, I'm not asking if your ring's saved. Are you saved? <laughs> A lot of people think that it's because of some lodge membership or some denominational dogma that they're saved. Salvation is a personal, volitional decision. And the question at this moment begs to be asked, demands to be answered. If you were to die at this very moment, do you have the assurance, no doubting, do you have the assurance that after the last breath is drawn, you'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? If you don't have that assurance today, why not now? Why not today? Yes to Jesus Christ, what is yet an opportunity. Would you stand please as we...